Welcome, and thank you for joining us. My name is Amin al Saden, and I'm the Nancy McCain and Bill Mornio Curatorial Fellow at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery. I have the honor of introducing today's program. Before I begin, I would like to first acknowledge the history, culture, and stewardship of the land from which I speak, the land of the many indigenous nations of this region, and that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We pay respect to these nations' elders, past, present, and emerging, and recognize their communities as custodians of these territories, despite centuries of settler colonialism. Second, I would like to acknowledge the prolonged struggle of communities of African descent, whose members were either forcefully brought to this land or have continued to endure racism, discrimination, and various forms of oppression that went hand in hand with the colonial enterprise. And third, I would like to salute those of us who have been displaced because of past and ongoing warfare and military intervention driven by neo-colonial pursuits and who find ourselves taking refuge in this country. These communities, among others, constitute Canadian society in its dazzling diversity. And these acknowledgements are necessary reminders that colonization in its different guises has left an indelible mark here and elsewhere. Its fraud legacy continues to be experienced worldwide, which is why this program has resonated with so many. We are truly grateful for your engagement wherever in the world you happen to be, and we hope today's panel will be as thought-provoking as those we have organized over the past few weeks. This panel is in fact the last in the series, so it is a bittersweet moment for all of us. It was several months ago when we started preparing along with the Istituto Italiano di Cultura Toronto for a symposium entitled Italy and East Africa, Unexplored Histories, to complement our exhibition, David El Petro's Spazio Disponible. It has been a pleasure for me to not only contribute to organizing this public program, a team effort led by my colleagues, Josh Human, Laura Demers, and more recently, Lucy Ferrari and Blair Swan, but to also work on the exhibition in close collaboration with the artist and the guest curator, Irene Campomi. I am thankful for everyone who contributed to making this project a great success, especially the director of the power plant, Gaetan Verna, whose vision made all this possible. Due to COVID-19, the symposium was reformatted to the current series of online panels. We came to realize that although the program had not materialized the way we had envisioned it originally, which seemed like another casualty of this ruthless pandemic, the new format became a blessing in disguise. It not only allowed us to connect with you all, and the audience engagement has been truly global, but also enabled everyone involved in the project to take their time and dwell on the difficult subjects we have been examining. This brings me to the participants, the brilliant minds and generous interlocutors who have helped illuminate various aspects of Dawit's exhibition. We are deeply grateful for your dedication to the program and it has been a real privilege to learn from your work. Our thanks go to Sean Anderson and Fabrizio Galanti, from whom we heard on June 20th, Teresa Fiore and Liz Park on June 27th, Carmen Belmonte and Irene Campomi on July uh, 11th, and finally today, we will hear from Germay Nagash in conversation with the artist himself, Dawit Alpetros. Recordings of previous panels have already been uploaded, so please visit our programs and events page if you've missed any. It is fitting that we conclude the series with a presentation by Germain Nagash. His work touches on so many of the themes that Dawit has been exploring over the past few years. Dawit has been dissecting the legacy of Italian colonization in his homeland of Eritrea, looking beyond its conventional definition as a form of political and economic domination. Instead, he is interested in how the colonial enterprise intersects with the aesthetics of modernism, with architecture and infrastructure, with historical and contemporary migrations, and with the projects of nationalism and identity formation. Similarly, Germay raises a series of questions about the intricate entanglements of modern mobility, urbanism, and warfare through his reading of the novel, The Conscript. Unfolding within the early 20th century, this novel for him also captures the manner in which Eritreans started articulating their modern identities. 
significantly, some of these conscripts participated in Italian uh, military campaigns and witnessed the atrocities committed against uh, other colonized subjects. So the novel brings to the surface dimensions of colonial history that often go unexamined. It is wonderful that both panels today are of Eritrean heritage, each probing the specificity of this context and exploring similar themes, but from uh, different angles. Germay focusing on literature, while Dawit works with the medium of art. I decided to keep my remarks today uh, short in order to give our panelists as much time as possible. Also, because this is your chance to ask questions about both the presentation and conversation today, as well as the exhibition and Dawit's work more generally. Gurmai will present for approximately 20 minutes and then engage in conversation with Dawit for about 30 minutes or so, including questions from the audience. Please type your contributions in the Q&A area at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Germain Nagash is professor of English and post-colonial literatures and the director of um, the African Studies program at Ohio University, where he teaches post-colonial and decolonial literatures and critical theory. He's widely published in journals, and he's the author, editor, and or translator of several books, including A History of Tigrania Literature in Eritrea in 1999, at the Crossroads, Readings of the Postcolonial and the, Co and the Global in African Literature and Visual Art, 2014, African Liberation Theology, Intergenerational Conversations um, on Eritrea's Futures, 2018, and a critically acclaimed translation of Gebreye Sous um, Hailu's 1927 novel, The Conscript from Tigrania into English in 2012. He earned MA degrees in English and Critical Theory from Vrij Universiteit Amsterdam in 1986 to 1991, and a PhD in African Literature from the University of Leiden in 1999. He was founding chair of the Department of Eritrean Languages and Literature at the University of Asmara, Eritrea, in 2001 to 2005, before he moved to Ohio University. He is currently on editorial boards for the Journal of African Literature um, Association and the African Studies Review. He's a member of the African Academy of Sciences and was, and was awarded the NEH 2015 and the STIAS uh, 2019 fellowships. He is the 2020-2021 president of the African Literature Association. Dawit El Petros is an artist who lives and works between Chicago and Montreal. He received his MFA in visual art from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts and Tufts University, a BFA in photography from Concordia University, a BA in history from the University of Saskatchewan, and completed the Whitney Independent Study Program in New York. Recent exhibitions have been held at the 13th Havana Biennial in Matanzas in Cuba, 2019, Herbert F. Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell University, 2019, uh, Bamako Encounters Biennial in Mali, 2017, Dakar Biennial in Senegal, 2018, uh, Prospect 4 in New Orleans in 2017, and the Walter Collection uh, Project Space in New York in 2016. Petros is an assistant professor at the Department of Photography, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Thank you, and please join me in welcoming Gurmai Nagash and Dawit Al Petros. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those who are joining us from a time zone where we are already in the afternoon hours. And thank you, Amir, for your very kind introduction. I would also like to thank Josh, Laura, Blair, 
and Dawit for all the work you have done in putting this program uh, together. Before we go forward, I would like to thank and recognize the power plant and the Instituto Italiano for hosting and sponsoring the symposium. And finally, I would like to commend my colleague presenters who have shared their work in the past weeks. It was truly outstanding and thank you all. Komun nukulukum agarn Afrikan abdas poran komkom nazi madabzi itikata tuluzal lokum nitagadasan dot kom in the Amas Gampu yakandelna kabil adali. Bifalayan Sidrabit Professor David Petroska Nisrahatan kum nagarin kuburin balihan wadukum kams gerna kanakuron kanabalon mukana mukakum. Because the topic has also to do a lot with Libya, let me also send a brief message in Arabic just to say, Ana Ahub Ogul Marhaba Bekum Al Akwan, Wo Al Akwat Min Erne Afrika, Bel Hamma, Wo Min Libya, Bihazi Al Munasaba. Shukran lakum ala musharikatikum. Okay, now back to my presentation. As announced, the title of my presentation today is Postcolonial Spaces, Modernity, Conscription and Resistance in Hylus Novel, The Conscript and Beyond. This presentation, I hope, will provide an informative glimpse into my reflections of how the dialectical relationship between colonial and post-colonial violence has impacted the post-colony of Eritrea in its trajectory of modern nation formation, both historically and culturally. As an added prefatory remark, I also want to note that while writing this intervention, and listening to the wonderful presentations by speakers who preceded me in this series of lectures, I detected an attempt at thinking to reopen dialogue on the question of Italian colonialism as one of the critical contributions of this symposium, organized as it is around David L. Petros's work. It was equally interesting to see the discussions recognizing that Italian history and identity cannot be separated from colonial history. Similarly, Eritrean history and identity cannot be conceived of meaningfully without a clear reckoning and understanding of the political, cultural, and indeed architectural influences of Italy, the former colonizer. Recognition of this connectivity implies the continuing and sustained need for research and dialogue not merely to address the historical problem of colonization, which is a problem of memory, but also to think through present day problems of migration and citizenship. These are real problems, acutely faced by both countries for which they bear historical and political responsibility, although in different yet profound ways. As I put together this presentation, this idea that colonialism and its after effects define the question of Italian and Eritrean relationships prompted me to consider some of the structures and cultures of violence that in macro and micro forms have been reproduced as reincarnations of the colonial legacy in Eritrea. While the imperialist and fascist violence of Italian colonization in Eritrea has been well documented. I believe that little systematic research has been done to illustrate the connections between that European violence and the current brutality of the post-colonial regime, both as policy and practice. Yet, despite the gap in the research in making these connections, ample evidence 
some encoded in language, including in the text of my focus, the conscript, and other inscribed in life, points the intricate relationship between the colonial and post-colonial violence. In the interest of clarity, I will break down the evidence into major categories. On the one hand, the fundamental theoretical recognition by post-colonial studies that the nation state architecture of post-colonial African states is a reproduction of colonialism, not only in its structural, that is to say administrative and bureaucratic, but also in more concrete recreations of political, cultural, and physical geographies determined by neocolonial violence very much applies to the case of Eritrea. In the Horn of Africa, Eritrea and a few other countries, including Somalia and the recently independent country of South Sudan, explicitly, explicitly corroborates this wider theoretical claim. More importantly, in the context of my presentation today, Eritrea illustrates almost perfectly how this colonially inherited structure and culture of violence can be used, indeed has been used, to unleash unchecked and voracious institutions that systematically zombify and or docilify bodies, to paraphrase Ashel Mbembe and Michel Foucault sequentially, through the militarization of political economies and conscription of the greater part of the demographics. At the same time, they expand, purge, eliminate, dispose of the unwanted bodies to exilic spaces. And indeed, in real life, the disposed bodies end up becoming refugees who too often lead risky, precarious, threadbare lives as they cross national and international boundaries, landscaped by hostile deserts and seas. These bodies, like all bodies in history, have of course their own histories with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Nonetheless, a genuine difference exists between the extraordinary biographies of these bodies and those who lead relatively normal lives. In the case of the former, their being is defined both by their ambivalent, fluid, and compelling life stories and their fractured, painful, and vulnerable identities. They start from their homes as able, adventurous, and risk-taking individuals. Their journeys grow more complicated and hazardous as they cross territories as unwanted immigrants, or to use a more charitable term, as transnational immigrants. Finally, most end up as refugees in detention camp, in the camp, which as the Italian philosopher, George Agamben theorized is indeed, and I quote, the place in which the most absolute conditio inhumana that has ever existed on earth is realized. In real places such as Libya and Italy, they come to represent the contemporary archetype of the tragic figure of the Homer Saker. As again, George Agamben described them based on his definition of the Homer Saker, and I quote, an enigmatic figure appearing in old Roman law as one who was considered outside both human and divine law, and whom anyone could kill with impunity, but was nevertheless not to be put to death according to ritual practices, end of course. At this point, I will shift my focus to talk briefly about the conscript to further argue the existence of a dialectical relationship between the violence of the colonial and post-colonial states, or in fact proposing that the violence of the post-colonial state is a simulacrum of the colonial state. This is because the conscript, a novel written by Gabriel Sailo in 1927, at the height of Italian fascist colonialism, eliminates historical information about the colonial experience with nuanced accounts of Eritrean conscripts, the Ascari, whom Italy deployed 
to fight against homegrown insurgents in Libya. Heil's critique of Italian colonialism highlights two points. On the one hand, colonialism engages the conscripts in an imperialist adventure by promising them material objects and tempting them with items of symbolic power, such as clothing, food, military uniforms, and glory by association with Italian Roman civilization, and therefore effective entry into the world of modernity. In this respect, besides military might, colonialism relied on what David Scott, quoting Stanley Diamond, in conscripts of modernity described as a culturation operating as a matter, as a matter of conquest, and wherein attenuated and weakened social economy and traditional culture is weaponized to turning entire populations into conscripts of civilization, not volunteers. And in fact, as is well documented some hundred years later, the post-colonial state of Eritrea, as in Heil's book, also employs mandatory conscription for its citizens, simultaneously enticing and threatening compliance dogmatically through language and punitive actions reminiscent of the era of Italian colonialism. On the other hand, highly engaged in providing a strong criticism of what they have called native complicity in an earlier work of mine. That is in an article entitled Native Intellectuals in the Contact Zone, Two Responses to Italian Colonialism. In this regard, Heil provides an inwardly looking critic in which he deconstructs the limits of Eritrean Habesha heroism, expresses solidarity with the Libyan combatants and honors the bravery of Libyan freedom fighters for resisting European occupation of their land while concurrently destroying Italian mythologies of racial superiority in war as in anything else. In one memorable statement, Heil warns his fellow countrymen to rethink their role as dogs of war. I will read the, the, the original Integrinia first. He says, Rafu on Arifti Zemazahum for Randa Kade. Rafu. Rafti Yadliak Mew Kamesi Buzah Sarahans Agaman Kutsoru Yadliak Mew Abzurusun Hagarzi Arabinke Amadium Rium Nan had her dom three om dollaha Is begins of he was who the shed a halb havesha Yba halu Nugdafum The atom sea Sala at home, I conon uqua. Sala at home da and taikum lumium. Gen the sratcums are a da. English one. Oh, my dear countrymen, have come not to rest. Have a rest. You need rest. For there is great work and hardship awaiting you in this hot country. The Arabs are watching from the horizon and telling each other, did you see the Habesha dog who sold his life for money? Let him be. Beware Habesha, the Arabs are not your enemies. Will you be able to recognize your true enemies? What will they say to you? For now, just try to rest. Excuse me. Some critics who reviewed the novel have rightly observed that the conscript is not a perfect book. The plot is uneven and the language at times anxious, distress, distressing, creating feeling of uneasiness. 
The novel even displays a problematic kind of colonial complicity, as I mentioned earlier, embodied in the text's characters. At the same time, the presence of these tensions and imperfect formal features in an odd way render power and importance to the book. As Timothy Bewes insightfully argues in his book, The Event of, the Event of Postcolonial Shame, it is both an extraordinary opportunity and a great challenge for postcolonial writers to write about colonialism. For them, the opportunity is also a test of ethical integrity. As Buse put it, they must figure out how to write critically without either contributing the inscription of inequality or reverting to a pathology of self-disgust. This is paradigmatically so, views adds, because all writing after colonialism, which is to say writing that comes into existence, always already aware of its reflection in the eyes of the other, is informed by this paradox. An obligation to write coexists with the impossibility of doing so innocently. Neither one thing nor the other, nor the obligation nor the impossibility is shameful, but the conjunction, historical and subjective at the same time, is intensely so." End of quote. Gabriel Heil's text was a prototype of the paradox laid out by Buse, and given the circumstances under which his book originated, it was a radically trans tra transformative work of art and ethics that had few peers in African literature at the time it was written. Postcolonial theorist Laura Christman is one of many commentators who wrote about the conscript, doing so with knowing critical intimacy. In her discerning introduction to my English translation of the novel, she makes the pertinent point that Gabriel Jesus Hyle's approach to colonialism anticipates the mid-century thinkers Franz Fanon and Aimé Césaire, in the sense that he was less concerned with universal abstracts and more with the concrete, physical, contemporary expression of colonial oppression. Chris Mann also argues that Hyle's understanding of nationhood both intersects and diverges from Benedict Anderson's notion of imagined communities. This is because while Hailu carries the sense of a synchronized conjuring of and attachment to a shared space beyond no noble locality, somewhat corresponding to Anderson's account of the nation as imagined, when it comes to the human members of this space, Hailu offers particularity, not abstract generality, Chrisman writes. That the conscript was premised upon the idea of geography, of people moving from one place to another, especially conscripted or drafted soldiers being deployed or moved, is further amplified in the processes and moments that exploited and brutalized them, as well as in how that eventually expanded their understanding of the national and international. Cumulatively, this transformation and understanding of themselves in relation to colonialism and modern warfare led to a revolt and the condemnation of the Italian colonial system. In theorizing space, Edward Said in culture and imperialism also insists on the necessity of thinking about geographies. He calls on literary and cultural historians to reflect on what all this historical experience of empire means for interpretations of the Victoria novel, say, or of French historiography, of Italian grand opera, of German metaphysics of the same period. That was a quote from Said. Said writes that while making general statements about individual works of art that preserve their uniqueness and worldly affiliations is difficult. He maintains that as open to different interpretations as works of art are, they can never be freed from the struggle over geography. Therefore, he reasons, we must attempt this. 
and sets the Earth in the global earthly context. Said, said further emphasizes the imperative to link time with space, geography with history, and our inquiries of art reflecting conflict because the colonial experience is not only about soldiers and cannons, but also about ideas, about forms, about images and imaginings. Gabriel Shailu did not theorize extensively about his own writing. Nonetheless, his ideas about the original motivation for his book and what he wanted to achieve with his intended, that is to say, Eritrean, and hidden, that is to say, international audiences, he apparently wanted his book to be read by the Arabs as well, are clear from the text. In the introduction to the novel, Hail writes in the autobiographical mode of the first person I to inform the reader about his identity as a writer and the production history of the book. Hail describes his text as a combination of fact and imagination. This book, which is being printed under the title A Story of a Conscript, he states, reflects my impressions when at the age of 18, I traveled to seek an education. It's also about the memory of my fellow countrymen, the Askari recruits who were traveling overseas at that time. I considered myself a blessed person and thank my God for enabling me to express the concerns and feelings of my people at that young age. According to the author, the manuscript of this novel was written in 1927, but the book could not be published until 1950 because of a problem with the means of printing. While the author did not elucidate further, the content and language of the book make it unmistakably clear that no way could it be formally printed and distributed under Italian rule in the 1930s, even if financial sponsors had been available. The book is a scathing criticism of Italian colonialism in Eritrea, and therefore the Italians would have had very little reason to allow its publication and availability to the colonized natives. In the rest of the novel, Hailu carries out what was programmatically described in his introduction. He offers increasingly vivid descriptions of the landscapes the conscripts traversed as they traveled from the railroad station in Asmara, the port of Masawa on the Red Sea, on to Port Sudan, port side in Egypt, and finally the hostile Libyan deserts where the war is fought between them and the Libyan revolutionaries. During the journey across the different local geographies within colonial Eritrea, they are astonished by what they see and experience. For example, the conscripts are bedazzled by the new urban setting of the city of Asmara. They are amazed by the motion of the trains that transports them from Asmara to support of Masawa. New to the experience, they describe the black trains that zigzag down the hilly slopes through gorges and into the darkness of tunnels as an evil force driving some miserable creatures to hell. And the black tracks that transport them are described as roaring, starving lions that are hungry to swallow the Habesha people in their beastly bellies. On the sea, they see dolphins and other large, large sea creatures for the first time. On arrival in Libya, they are similarly startled by their new environment, but also confused and scared. They wonder about the, posi pos the positioning of the moon, the stars, and the sun, as they grow increasingly aware of the thunderous desert winds enveloping them. The geographical disorientation, the noise, and the dust, so graphically described by Hailu in well-crafted paragraphs, underline the novel's heart of the matter, the cruelty of the unjust war, and the tragic fate of the conscripts. In the subsequent battle, the Libyan insurgents provide a staggering force of resistance. Despite their unsophisticated war equipment, and nearly all of the Habesha conscripts, already weakened by the physical adversity of the Libyan deserts, perish there. 
to Cabo, the central character and a few others survive with the harrowing memory to tell the story as we now know it from Hylus text. After the decisive battle, through the si though the silent protest against the war had been simmering for some time, Tukabo finally comes to recognize the irony and contradiction that they had been fighting to maintain, had, they had been fighting, excuse me, to maintain the same colonial system that was oppressing themselves and their people. The hero of the novel declares, and I quote, it was strange to watch the Habesha, who at first did nothing when their land was taken and bowed the Italians like dogs, as if that were not shameful enough indeed, preparing to fight those Arabs who wanted to defend their country. The Habesha were fighting for those who came to colonize and to make others tools of colonizing African neighbors without anything of benefit in their country or society. On the same page, we also see Tukabo deeply immersed in meditations about the war, considering the consequences for his country and his people, for the Libyans, and for the future relationships between the Arabs and the Africans. With his concern extending beyond the immediate impact of this war, he is also doubtlessly worried about the intergenerational repercussions of what this could mean to each community. In a chilling message to his people, to Cabo warns, and again, I quote at length, there might be some who think that fighting the Arabs on behalf of the Italians and exterminating them from the face of the earth was, forg was forgivable, considering that the Arabs and Black Africans historic, were historically enemies. But what was being done would one day lead to one's fall. If one day they come led by a Frenchman or an Italian to fight, didn't the Habesha know that the Arabs were going to pay back with vengeance? Don't they know that they would tell their children, generation after generation, that whatever they might forget, they would not forget the blood of Habesha? and that this bloodletting would go on forever, end of quote. The novel ends with a traditional jerk poem adopted by Hailu from oratory to literature and sung by the central character. In it, he condemns colonialism and says farewell to arms. The ending stanza of the poem reads, farewell to arms. I am done with Italy and its tribulations that robbed me of my land and parents. I am done with conscription and Italian medals. Farewell to arms. This closure of Heil's novel is extremely important. And I want to reflect briefly on why this is so by drawing your attention to three points of reflection. My first point is fairly straightforward. It seems that Hyle's ending with a poem from oral tradition deliberately underscores two fundamental ideas. One is that his novel as a modernist text is neither entirely modern nor wholly traditional, but a transgeneric text consisting of the two competing and merging traditions. Second is the affirmation that because the conscript is set on the boundary of modernity and tradition. The set of questions that can be posed about the text, what it is, what it represents or symbolizes, or how it can be interpreted, are intrinsically interlaced with larger, with larger questions that can be posed about the present, where an inquirer like myself can ask open questions. They can be asked without the certainty of knowing or foreclosing the answers beforehand, but nonetheless with a critical responsibility that unlocks difficult and complex questions and conversation threads for further thinking. As for the second point of reflection, the fact that Hyde chooses to conclude his story by invoking the words farewell to arms 
and not, for example, with something like rise up in arms against the Italians, a choice which oral tradition would still have enabled him to do, displays the maturity of his understanding of the post-colonial condition. This is in the sense that calling for such rebellion also could involve the possibility that his people would be engaged in a new cycle of war. My third and last point of reflection takes me back to the idea that I raised concerning the dialectical relationship between the violence of the colonial and post-colonial states, and particularly as it pertains to the question of conscription. Hailu in the conscript was very keen to redeem the conscripts from prejudiced colonial scapegoating, and sometimes, and sometimes even took pride in their bravery, despite his condemnation of their participation and complicity in the war. And once his main character, Tukabo, assumed the role of a returning veteran soldier who lives to expose the lies and deceptions of colonialism and war to his people and the world, Hailu grants him the power of language to drive off the evil of war and conscription from the land. Unfortunately, Hailu's symbolic call for demilitarization and bringing peace to the land did not materialize for well-documented historical and political reasons, as the terrible events in Lampedusa, Libya specifically, and the Mediterranean Sea in general have shown. Eritrea has been persistently haunted by the impacts of war and conscription since its inception in 1890 to the present day. To reiterate the point in a different way, the ghosts of Gabrielus Hylus men continue to linger in Eritrean memory and life, reminding us of the continuing history of conscription in the country and taking us back to the source, colonial Italy. His description of the abject lives of the conscripts from a century ago also activates in memory parallel images of the mass of used and disposable bodies, mostly former conscripts, who indeed, as I stated earlier, are the modern day homo sacer, who fight for survival as they relocate from and across deserts and seascapes. It is all too evident that while the cycle of violence, conscription, and mass migration of peoples has come to full circle, the realization of this persistent dialectic in the nation's history also means that all must cooperate in a concerted effort to end the perpetuity of violence by saying farewell to arms and genuinely start working for peace. Thank you. Blair and Dawit, back to you. Thank you very much, Germai. That was uh... That was excellent. Um, you and I are engaged in a project that intersects in many important ways. And I think the discussion that orients around how we examine and deal with the colonial era in order to better understand how these historical events shape and affect the contemporary challenges of migration and citizenship, as you write in your paper, is, a, is an important point of convergence. So I would like to have a discussion that really is positioned between what I think you've so wonderfully articulated is this persistent haunting of colonial ghosts and the echoes of resistance that reverberate across time in the writing of, of, of a figure like Gavreyes' Hailu's The Conscript and also another historical uh, figure that perhaps I would, we can discuss at some point um, Fasaha Gergis about the author's journey, another seminal text that figures in your work written in 1895. But I would like to begin with a question that contextualizes the, the text a little bit. Um, and it is really about 
the extent to which the conscript is either an outlier or is emblematic of other colonial critiques in Eritrean tradition, in Eritrean culture? Are there other works that are engaged in, uh, in this similar project? And the follow-up question to that is, if there isn't a tradition of anti-colonial literary critique in, in Eritrea that develops after 1927, why? Uh, th that's a very good question, David. Um, I, I think uh, just to contextualize the, the, the literature of Eritrea that um, um, holds through for the literature of the Horn of Africa, particularly Ethiopia and Eritrea, and probably uh, more in the region too, is that you cannot really talk about uh, about history of the Tigrinya literature or Amharic uh, for that matter without thinking of Ges. Uh, so there is this long tradition of, of writing in Ges, um, uh, mainly centered, you know, in, in the monasteries, in the, in the, ch in the church. Uh, so everything kind of comes out from that. Uh, the alphabet is based on that, and especially the, uh, the the poetry and even the prose in terms of meditation. So, so the, you know what we call hatata, you know, the commentary, giving commentary. Uh, in oral tradition, it's of course called uh, as 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 you know, dahan yahavana. You know, so you, you interview people come and dahan uh, yahavana, and then people listen to them. Uh, so the commentary, the the uh, the oral tradition, and the writing. Uh, is is starts with 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 guess. so maybe as a point of kind of re reflection, uh, what we need to be reminded of is when we speak of modernity and tradition in the African context, for uh, the, for Ethiopia and Eris and Eritrea, uh, this these places had their own so to speak vernacular modernity in terms of writing. In terms of, of in, 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 in terms of their transnational international relationship with the outside world, uh, for example, there is a, a book. Uh, it's, it's a treat, it's a small one. Um, I am kind of blanking out now, but it will come back to me. <laughs> oh, okay, the Periplus of the <laughs> of the Eritrean Sea. You know, there is, there is a story that are going on when the traders come from, from Egypt, from, from Greece, from India, from, 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 from Europe, from Italy, uh, to trade with the local uh, Habesha in, the, in, the, in that region. They are coming with all these things uh, to take ivory mainly, uh, but they are importing, you know, wine, things like that, and spices and so on and so forth. So, this trans uh, transaction in terms of, of opening up, that is one aspect of modernity, of course, uh, with, with, with outside world, it, was, it has been there. Uh, so going back to your question specifically, is uh, the corner script an outlier, is kind of an exception? Uh, are there, were there other comparable, uh, you know, pieces of, uh, literature from 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 that time, uh, there was some writing. There was some writing, indeed. Uh, you mentioned Fasah Gergis, for example. You know the the journey. Um, small small pieces there were. There is there, there is the, there were poetry as well. Uh, but in my uh, at least so far in my research, I have not come across. Uh, a text that is so powerful, that is so engaged, uh, like the conscript. Uh, what gave, what gave, uh, what gives power to uh, the conscript is, of course, its complexity. And as you know, uh, Abba, Doctor Abba Gabrielsus Haidu, uh, he was a highly educated man. Uh, he spoke, of course, several languages, including Italian, Tigrinya. Uh, of course, Amharic and Arabic, probably French too, um, and Latin. He wrote his PhD in Latin. So the conscript, if you kind of uh, start, I read it 
um, at least once a year, again and again. It's it's it's, it's a kind of it's it's a gold mine. So there are there are these different elements um, from different cultures and languages that are there. Uh, in the broader context of Africa, yes, in South Africa there were there were novels written before the conscript, okay. Uh, but the conscript is one of um, the few, really one of the few um, novels that has been written in an indigenous African language. So it was an outlier, yes, but at the same time, it emerged as one of kind of the best expressions from what was in the history as well in his contemporary uh, times. Okay, and so I would like to maybe, here's an opportunity to perhaps discuss uh, the specificity of Italian education policy in Eritrea. What was the nature and the characteristic of Italian education policy within the context of Eritrea over from 1890 to 1941? And how, what type of role may that have exerted? So that we're trying, as you're saying, having this difficulty in finding other historical corollaries. Is there a relationship between the form of education and the absence of literature in this anti-colonial tradition or, liter or literature as a literature? Uh, it, 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 is, it, is, it is, I think it's difficult to come up with a broad statement about mm. the education uh, system there, uh, as we know, uh, it was limited to the natives, so-called natives, uh, the Habesha, the Eritreans, the Ethiopians, and they now you could go up to grade four. Uh, my father was a conscript in the second generation of conscripts, so they, they, they taught them small things, like he was, he was a very good mechanic, he was grateful for that. They, they told them things like how to count, you know, numbers and, and read a little bit and speak, yes. Uh, but they were, not, they were not encouraging them, you know, to, 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 to advance in, go to whatever secondary school and so on and so forth. Um, the same applies to my mother, who was, who, was, who was worked with Italians as well as a cook. So she spoke fluent Italian, she could count numbers, that kind of thing, but uh, the, 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 I don't think the Italians were interested in educating, in educating the Eritreans. Uh, at the same time, we have to say there were some very highly educated Eritreans. Uh, and the education, I would like to put it in a bigger framework. Uh, so, it, I mean, to speak of education is a tricky thing. Uh, in terms of having a school curriculum and that kind of thing, uh, it was limited for, for, for the Habesha, for the Eritreans uh, in that case, but don't forget the education of the church as well. Don't forget of the, of, of the education that comes from Quranic schools as well. So the Quranic schools and the church and the monasteries they were, they were educating the people. Still, the rate of illiteracy, Dawit, if you, if, you, if you think of Eritrea, rate of illiteracy is, I don't know how, what, what the percentage is, but it seems to be low. When I was doing my research uh, in Eritrea, at least some years back, uh, what I saw was people were really literate, you know? They could, they could read in their own language because they were, they were getting it from, from the church schools, from, from the Quranic schools, uh, uh, that, that kind of thing. Uh, I am reluctant to, to say anything like about the causality, so there was no education, so there was no literature, I mean, but that is, I think, the, the general picture. Okay, um, good. So it's, there are, I would like to, I want to come back to this, to this, to the ambivalence of the, of the Ascari of the conscripts, but I'll come back to that in just a moment. The other question that I have is really around this, the exhibition, the work, the research that I've been doing, but also many of the uh, preceding conversations with our presenters have, has been around the, this question of the history and memories that are not accessible due to uh, active factors of, uh, of, uh, of not forgetting or of not remembering. And so a significant focus of the conversation really has been the displacement, uh, to quote Teresa Fiore, the displacement of the of Italian sort of memory around the question of coloniality. Uh, 
So I would like to center the position of the subject position of Eritrea and ask that question is where do we, where does the, the, the colonial experience reside within our memory? Meaning how do we reflect on our moment as colonial subjects of, in the period? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so, you know, uh, there is a tendency, there is a proverb in, in our language as well, but there is a proverb that goes something like this. Uh, the, the one who, the victimizer might forget, but the victimized will not. So as victim, victims of oppression, okay, and, and in this case of colonialism, uh, we, we live with the memory. Uh, when you start thinking of, of, of the conscription, there is memory there. When you, when you, when you, when you, think, when you start thinking of, of, of the cities and free labor and so on and so forth, the memory comes back. Uh, not speak of the people of the, of the conscripts who went to Libya and who perished in the desert. Um, so the memory for, for Eritreans of Italian colonialism is, is there, it comes, and we, we, have, we have to study it, uh, we have to rethink it in, in, in different ways. On the Italian side, it is, it is complicated. The Italian scholars, uh, even those who, uh, you know, call themselves post-structuralist, post-colonial thinkers, um, very progressive ones. They are, uh, sh they shy away from talking about the colonial heritage. One of the cliches of Italian scholarship is, well, it was benign kind of colonialism, right? We loved the Eritreans, the Eritreans loved us, still, you know, all, the, all, all that kind of um, uh, language uh, is there. When you look carefully at, um, for example, at what, uh, say, major Italian thinkers and writers, uh, I am thinking, for example, because I, uh, my area is literature and critical theory, uh, people like Umberto Eco, you know, there is a book called Interpretation and Overinterpretation. Uh, there is, he has a book also, I think, I don't, uh, 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 the, the, the open work, I forget the title in Italian. So I was looking at it like to, to see for examples that came from the post colony, Eritrea, Libya, Somalia, and so on, Ethiopia, so on and so forth. No, uh, it is as if even in the minds of great thinkers like Umberto Eco, this colonial experience of, of Italy didn't exist, total erasure. Um, even, uh, the great major uh, contemporary thinker, George Agamben, I was referring to in my presentation, uh, Agamben has plenty of chance, uh, uh, you know, to talk to Eritrean, to Somalis, and so on and so forth. Uh, so in his writings, he, he indeed does uh, refer to, reflect on this phenomenon of migration and refugeeism. Uh, in general conceptual, you know, uh, terms. There are, there are plenty, I mean, there are constellations of terms and concepts you can say, I, at least I was thinking in my uh, subjective space when reading him, okay, he's thinking about the Somalis, about the Eritreans and so on. But there is no direct mention of the post colony So there is forgetfulness, there is erasure uh, from, from the side of, uh, Italy with regards to its colonies. But what I'm then hearing you say, sort of, then I think we also, I think ultimately what I'm trying to sort of get to is the acts of erasure and forgetfulness within the Eritrean context as well. But I think, and here's an opportunity for me to uh, address some of the questions that are coming in. So there's one that is asking you to comment on, has there been an attempt to compile literature from Eritreans and non-Eritreans, including Italians, Ethiopians, Libyans, to complement and enrich the narratives of this important topic. 
Uh, that is an idea for a bigger project. Thank you for whoever is asking. Uh, I mean, we, we, are, we, are, we are kind of the, us working in separate kind of in our own ways. Um, I don't know any concerted major project that is kind of bringing together, uh, you know, different thinkers from different places, artists, you know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think we'll my, bring this. We'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll get the name of the. the we'll provide you with the uh, with the questioner's name, and perhaps you have a co-editor for uh, okay, for a new anthology. Um, another question that I would like to have you address is the, that narrative construction that you alluded to, other, other presenters have also spoken about it, brave gente, Italians as both a benign presence within the colonial project, but also Italians, the, empire, the project of empire as a constructive positive force in Eritrea, as opposed to a violent occupation. And I think connected to that is the question that I would, you know, the question that I would add to that is the specificity of the Italian colonial project. Because part of the problematic, I think, is superimposing interpretive frameworks that are extrapolated from colonial experiences in other parts of Africa and putting them on top of the Italian colonial project. So on the one hand, how does that project, how does that narrative get constructed? And how is that? And how is that project specific to Italy's ambitions in the Horn of Africa? So I kind of detect, you know, the, in your question, there are two dimensions. At least I, I would like to respond uh, that way to your question. So there is one. This uh, it is a problem of of methodology in the first place. Um, it's a philosophical question, but um, it is it is mainly a problem of methodology, I think, as for us as researchers. So when those of us who studied post-colonial spaces, uh, one way um, to go is that is actually the conventional one that many uh, post-colonial scholars have pursued, is this this construction. Uh, um, understanding of a colonial intervention as a tragedy, uh, which means in practice what it, what it means is the language and the, and the narrative becomes uh, loaded, overloaded with lament. Colonialism was bad, colonialism was this, and so on and so forth. So it destroyed tradition. Uh, and then as a response to that, there is this uh, desire, anticipation, uh, which is also um, conflicted in a way. On the one hand, wanting to go to the past, which is which is impossible, uh, but also going forward, kind of to emulate modernity in the way and in the fashion that was developed by the West. You see. So there is a double bind there. And that is, that is because it's considered as tragedy. On the one hand, they are saying this was a tragic event, event, but I want to build a nation that is developed with democracy, with elections, with capitalism, and so on and so forth. You see, this is, this is, this is the contradiction. Um, what seems to be maybe, uh, I would say a better approach, but maybe something to explore is uh, to look at modernity as something that has happened. Uh, and then that will enable you without too much lamenting and rage and anger uh, to kind of say, this is what we have. This is what modernity did to these post-colonial spaces. So what do we do with it? These are hybrid societies now. These are hybrid communities now. We have many languages in our, you know, in, a, in, in our mouths. We dress the way we dress. We eat the way we eat. We 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 have we, we have traveled. We have changed a lot. And the same also in the in the local places in the post colony. So um, maybe a, a realistic way to do it is um, to try to understand it more and more in 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 in. in, in, in that sense. 
um, I think I have responded to more to the methodological. Um, yeah, you know, but it would be could question, you question, could you yeah. speak to the could you speak to the narrative construction of the Italians as a benign presence um, in Eritrea? Where does that narrative emerge from? Hmm. Um, I think it's part also of uh, Italy's history. I, I, Italy, you know, after the Second World War, is it, I mean, it was total humiliation, right? It was complete total humiliation. So uh, Italian society had to deal with its own defeat, with its own kind of damage and, and wound. They lost the colonies. At the same time, they lost the war during the Second World War. So Italy has to deal with its own kind of sense of identity. Don't forget, Italy was, was relatively a new nation. You know, you know, it's a new nation. So it had also to understand uh, what it was as an emerging European uh, state, uh, nation state, but at the same time with all the demagogy and so on and so forth, I'm thinking of Mussolini now, well, it, it, it lost the war. So the Italians had to come to themselves and, and, and ascend themselves. So at the same time, when you come uh, to, to tell the Italian society, well, you have also done, some, done something wrong somewhere. Oh, oh, I have been done wrong here. I am grieving. I'm kind of trying to uh, understand myself. So that is, that is automatically kind of um, forgotten. So Italy had to skill, I think, uh, deal, cope with multiple uh, memories of, 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 of trauma. And that uh, post-colonial trauma, the colonial trauma tends to be uh, put aside, at least for the time. Okay. So I think this is an appropriate time for me to pose this question that was, that was presented uh, in, the, in, in the chat earlier, is your thoughts on the term post-colonial as it relates to Eritrea? So Eritrea being an independent state driven by a policy of self-reliance, but one that seems to be dominated by hegemonic powers that demand social, cultural, economic subservience. So all of this, the writer asks, makes the term confusing to understand within this context. That, that, that is a very good question, you know? Uh, so when you talk about uh, Eritrea as a post-colony, there are in Eritrea there is a post-colony in terms in its relationship with Italy, but Eritrea is also a post-colony in relationship to the African, you know, Ethiopian occupation and colonization of Eritrea. So we are kind of when you think about Eritrea, people need to, to understand that there are these levels, okay? Uh, also in terms, I mean, this, these are just terms that are used for, 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 for analysis. Uh, yeah. Some scholars have described the Eritrean situation. It is a unique, you know, kind of special kind of colony. Others have said, well, it's a secondary form of colonialism and so on and so forth. Uh, but by the end of the day, uh, colonialism is what it is. Uh, it is occupation of land, of geographies. Uh, so when, when you, when you uh, talk about Eritrea and apply this sense, it's a general term, this post-colonial, post colony Yes, it's post-colony in many ways, uh, but there are gradations, differentiations within that, within, within that understanding. So I think this, just very quickly, if we look at it historically, we, 43, with the, the establishment of the British administration, the federation with Ethiopia, and then the uh, the Thirty Year War of Independence. I think that this these are the historical um, right. the yeah. factors that you're addressing in terms of how the colonial uh, the presence of a quote unquote colonizing sort of force is, uh, is is made complicated within the context of Eritrea. But I would like to come back to this question of the 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 paradox of complex, the, the paradox and complexity of complicity uh, in the text, because the, on the one hand, the, the conscript, Hilo speaks of the conscript as, uh, as acting as dogs of war. But simultaneously, we have the presence of the, the, uh, the Ascari and the conscript as agents of, as agents of a particular form of modernity. So if you could 
potential, if you could just speak to that, so that is one of the few opportunities that was available to Eritreans was the military and the type of labor that was accessible through military operations. So could you discuss the other side of this, um, of this ambivalence and this contradiction, which is the role of the conscripts Ascari in the set of relations and strategies which builds out and establishes sort of the seeds for what becomes Eritrean national identity, which then plays itself out in, uh, in certain complexities over time. So Haile's problem uh, is of course uh, the problem of the post-colonial subject, the double consciousness, the ability to be, uh, to, to live in two cultures, in his case, uh, between Italy and Eritrea, and, the, and within Eritrea there is diversity as well. Uh, the same on the side of, of, of Europe. So the complexity is always, the, the, as we say, the post-colonial subject, it is, it is the, the consciousness is always um, double, triple, multiple. Uh, so what he, it seems to me, what uh, Heil's concert uh, fundamentally was, he, uh, he, he rejected colonialism and violence. And his rejection and condemnation of colonial violence was not abstract. He saw how the conscripts fared, okay, when they were being transported to Libya, how they perished in Libya. Uh, I didn't have the time to talk about it, but in the conscript in, in, in Hayus text, there are passages where the military, the top commanders of the Italian army are just, you know, beating up this, this man, grown man, you know, uh, call, calling them all kinds of, 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 of names. Uh, there is particular uh, episode which comes to my mind as I speak to you now in the conscript. They are in the desert and there is, a, there is lack of water and everybody wants really kind of have a drop of water. And then the, the Italian commanders, you know, they, 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 they protect their water. So they are, they are you know, they, 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 they hide it, they protect it. And people are just I will say people were kind of dying the conscripts for lack of a drop of water. There was a lot of humiliation. There was a lot of violence, physical violence, um, you know, verbal, verbal insults, uh, mistreatment. So Hailu was, was, was disgusted by that, okay? Uh, at the same time, Hailu uh, understood that the Eritreans, or the Habesha generally, because they were in, from, from other parts of Ethiopia as well, uh, he, he thought, hey, you have responsibility too. You know, you don't have to take this just like that. It can be critical, it can be revolting, you can even, you know, desert the, the, the Italian colonial army, and above all, Please do not go and fight against other African brothers and sisters because this is not your war. Mm -hmm. This is how he, what, 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 what his, his fundamental concerns was were. That is that is the context how the framework, the bigger right. framework, larger framework, um, which makes me think, you know, that the complicity is there, the condemnation of the war is there, you know, fair word times enough, but the complicity too. And I think uh, from a formal point of view, uh, and for me as a translator, if the conscript was merely an allegorical story, right? They came and conquered us and they killed us, or they came and conquered us and we defeated them, it will be kind of a linear story, which is not very interesting really. Uh, it would be a very simple plain uh, plot. It would have its own merits, but no complexity. I was drawn very much to it because of the complexity of the plot. This is entangled, it's very, it's very interesting. Um, 
Yeah. And it bears, and it comes to bear, you know, for me specifically, to, to, it's when I see our brothers and sisters who are passing through Libya, the activation of these histories, the, the return to Libya, that it's not just a transit point, a geographical transit point to Europe, but that within the context of Libya, it also surfaces these, these painful histories. I would like to shift towards our last question um, and sort of connect a question that I had to the question that is, uh, th that has been, you know, that has been posed is to really think about so much of colonial discussion overemphasizes Italy, the West at the expense of, at the expense of local um, African perspectives. So why when there's such a plenty of material in local voices, are these perspectives not engaged with as much? And how widely, so, so the second part of this question is, how widely or not is Hailu's novel studied in Eritrea today? So I'm curious to know its place and reception within contemporary Eritrean culture. And this is the last question that I will pose to you. Uh, I guess in terms of, uh, you know, the production of, of, of texts and archives um, in both localities, in this case, in Italy and uh, in, in, in Italy and in Eritrea. Uh, the, 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 there, is, there is, of course, um, the problem that uh, I would say uh, there is a problem because uh, the majority of the researchers historically from the West who were studying Africa or Eritrea uh, used to speak the local languages, the African languages. So if you are a researcher and you travel to Africa and then you have the, 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 you know, the, the, the languages, you can speak them, you, can, uh, you have access directly to the community and what they are saying, what they are writing about, how they write about them. Uh, your, the production of, of, your, of your research, of your scholarship will be less, uh, it will be based less on binaries because you are kind of bringing the different texts and knowledge systems into conversation. Uh, if that is not the case, then we have a binary effectively, which means texts that are produced in European languages and texts that are produced in African language. That is very problematic and the problem of knowledge, the problem of, uh, of, 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 of methodology, um, and ultimately it's a philosophical problem in the sense that it's a, it is a problem of epistemology uh, because it is epistemology is power and, and knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the, the second part? The second of part of the question was how well known is the conscript in Eritrea? Oh, from what I, uh, when I, when I was at the University of Asmara, we, we were teaching it, we were, you know, people were reading it. Um, so I know many, many people are famil familiar with the text. Uh, my understanding is without doing any systematic research in that, I mean, in terms of questionnaire and so on, the older generation of writers in Eritrea, uh, you know, they, are, they, they, know, they know what the text is, they talk about it. Um, I don't know how it, it, is, it is read um, in contemporary Eritrea, uh, but with the translation, uh, I think it has reached the, the international audience. So I can you know, happily say that uh, there are plenty of reviews written about, about this book. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Germay. Your work has been instrumental for me. And it's funny, it's interesting, I think that we're, we conclude this conversation, this four part, uh, event, but a lot of my research began with your translations and your work. And so it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to have this conversation with you today. Uh, and I'd like to take a few moments now to thank all of the panelists for an illumin illuminating three previous weeks of dialogue. Uh, their presentations for me have opened up an enormous amount of question and an and a greater understanding of the context in which I'm working and thinking, but they've also given me a profound interpretations and analysis of my own work for which I'm grateful. So I wanna thank Sean Anderson, Fabrizio Galante, Teresa Fiore, Liz Park, 
Carmen Belmonte, and again, to thank you, Germay. Uh, I would also like to reiterate my gratitude to Alessandro and the Italian Cultural Institute, everyone at the power plant, beginning from Gaetan, to Josh, Laura, Blair, and Amin, who have worked so hard on, uh, on, the, on these, uh, on these uh, presentations. And my final thank you to the guest curator of Spazio Disponible, Irene Campolmi, who has been an incredible comrade and an ally throughout this process. And my gratitude to those of you who have joined us over these past four weeks. And with that, I will turn it over to Amin. Thank you, Germay and Dawid, for such uh, a rich and enticing conversation. And thank you for answering some of the audience questions. Um, I am sure there are many others, uh, but today's conversation, as well as this whole program, is really only an invitation to further explore these important subjects. We thank you all for joining us today, um, and a special thanks to those who followed this entire series. If you missed any of the panels, please visit our uh, website for recordings. Also, it is worthwhile mentioning that our publication on Dawit's work is scheduled to be released towards the end of this year. Uh, this will be a sizable volume uh, documenting the exhibition and presenting important scholarship about the topics we have been uh, probing in this program. The publication will be available through our online shop. Thanks again. Please stay safe and healthy and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>